Welcome to the Airdale. I'm Chloe Lewis. And I'm Andrew Cronister. Today we'll be talking about what people did on vacation, how the school budget is determined and spent, History Day, Science Fair, and much, much more coming up on The, the Airdale. Airdale. Directly from the Alma High School News Studio, covering news and sports from where it matters, you're watching The Airdale. You could go on and on about how many things people have done over the winter break. Here is Grayson Hopper and Tyler Wilcox highlighting some of the things that people did over the break. Many students did a variety of things over the holiday break, such as vacations and family gatherings. So we asked a couple of students to see what they did over the break. Um, we went to a Fayetteville Adventure Park and that has like go-karts and um, laser tag and an arcade. And then we went to the Fayetteville Mall, which is a lot bigger than the Fort Smith Mall. And then we just stayed home and played video games. And then I painted, so that was fun. Um, I went to California with my mom and some friends. Um, I was actually with my dad over the break. We, um, I got to hang out with him and everything since I don't see him a lot, but, um, we open presents on Christmas Eve and everything, so um, I would be able to go to California on Christmas Day with my mom. I did go on vacation. I went to a really big cabin in Branson with my family. Um, I went. I didn't really stay at home much. I went shopping with my aunts, and then we went to see the Dixie Stampede in the Branson Landing. We hope you had an amazing holiday break, and we will see you next time. I'm Grayson. And I'm Tyler with Airways Media. Alma has a lot of diverse programs and activities that are constantly refreshed with new things for students to learn from and work with. Those new things can be expensive and have to be bought with the money from the annual budget provided by the school. This is the only the basics though. Sarah Nutt and Seth Canales took a deeper dive into how the school budget is created. Schools are very expensive to run. There's teachers to be paid, students to be fed, sports, maintenance costs, and sometimes renovation costs. All these things combined and more can rack up a big bill. And today we'll be discussing how this money is spent. We work very, very hard to handle the budget, handle our budget very carefully. Uh, you never have enough. There's always things you'd like to do that you can't afford. That's true for you, me, and the school district. There's always something else you'd like to have. But we have to make careful decisions that we take care of the have-tos before we ever think about the want-tos. The main budget for the school district is for salaries. Teachers need to be paid, custodians, cafeteria workers, and even the people in the office. Salaries aren't the only school expense, though. School buildings are massive, and with a massive building, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. General cleanliness also makes it easier for students to learn. Although the government and state pays for most of these expenses, many fundraisers are held to help out financially. A big example of this is the Heirloom Store, which is run by DECA. The store is located inside the school and sells things like t-shirts and sweaters. Clearly, schools spend a lot of money on good education. I'm Sarah Nutt with Airwaves Media. Happy New Year's, Airedales! Everyone in Airways wishes you a Happy New Year and good luck with the topic of this story, resolutions. Whether it be to make new friends or start working and making money for yourself, it can be a hard thing to do. Evan Sanderson took a deeper look into people's New Year's resolutions at Alma. For some people, New Year's is a fresh start. We found out how some Alma High School students and teachers are planning to start the New Year's right. New Year's resolutions is an agreement you set up with yourself at the beginning of the year. Some of them are to try to stay healthier or spend more time with family. Some of my, um, two of the New Year's resolutions I set for myself this year was to meal plan um, on the weekends, like two to three meals per week so that I don't have to worry about coming home and spending a lot of time cooking dinner. Instead, I can spend more time with my kids and still have a good dinner to eat that evening. And then another one would be um, just setting aside every few months a weekend or a Saturday to go do a small day trip with um, my family um, and just setting aside time to make more memories with them. Student Kyle Bowen says he's going to try to take steps towards a healthier lifestyle. Well, one of my New Year's resolutions is to drink more water. Well, I really like water and I think that increasing the amount of water I drink every year is good because it is easy and I actually do it. 
English teacher Miss Mick says her resolution is to be more intentional. Um, well, everybody, I think, tries to do the healthy New Year's resolutions, like trying to eat healthier and stuff. And I always do try to do that sometimes, and it usually lasts a couple of weeks. But I'm trying to eat healthier this year, and then being more intentional with um, reading my Bible and reading scripture and that kind of thing. Um, just because I think it's, I think it's always good to try to better yourself, and there's no better time to better yourself than the beginning of a new year. Whatever your resolution is, hopefully it makes your 2022 better. For Airwaves Media, I'm Evan Sanderson. National History Day is an annual history project competition in which students do their best to compete against others to win and presenting a historical argument based on a theme. Remy Scarber took a look into this year's event. History Day is an important day that gives students an opportunity to learn about new things and learn research skills which is necessary for their education. History teacher, but I think that History Day, just the entire process is so good for students. I think it, they have to choose a topic, um, so they get to have some choice in that matter and they get to pick something that they might be passionate about or something that they just want to know a little something about. They also get to choose their category, so if they like writing papers, they get to do that. If they want to do something more visual, they can you know, do the exhibit. If you like tech stuff, you can either do a documentary or do the website. If you're more artsy and performance minded, you can do a performance, so I love that. Working on a project takes a lot of time and dedication, but the results are worth it. Some of the information, it was really hard to find because considering our topic was like back in the 1500s, so it was hard to just find you know, primary sources like that we needed that made the project better. So, The whole point of this is to teach students to enjoy history and find creative ways to express themselves. My, my favorite part is always getting to hear students enjoy the process and learn and talk about what they've learned and be passionate about it. I'm Remy Scarber for Airways Media. Just finished my science fair project. Like, talk about last minute. Wow, did it take you a long time to do it? Um, we're not gonna talk about that. But science fair is coming up here at AHS and Josh Wagley has the details. Although the science fair is coming up, students have been working on their project for months. MLI school teacher Jerry Kelly states they started working on their project during the beginning of the year. Well, science fair has been uh, going on since uh, the early part of first semester. And so we kind of start off with some experimental designs and, and some ideas and things like that uh, early on, like in September. Uh, we run that process, you know, experimentation, research, uh, putting together the paper, and then uh, finishing it off with, with doing a board presentation. Uh, we kind of, that process usually happens from September all the way through January. And so uh, now that we're in January, we're to the part where we're kind of finishing up presentations and everything. And so uh, science fair being February 10th, uh, as long as we can wrap up presentations and have all of that stuff ready, uh, by then students should be good to go and present their research to judges. Mr. Kelly states even though science fair is hard work, it creates several opportunities for students to participate. Well, whenever we have that competition, uh, students are uh, competing against each other in different categories. And uh, the winners of those categories, first, second, and third place, actually move on to another competition uh, at the University of Arkansas. Uh, that'll be in March. And so uh, once we get those winners and we move on, they get to compete for uh, state level competition, international level competition, uh, all kinds of special awards where they can actually win money or scholarships and things like that. So uh, just getting the project done is not the end all be all. Like presenting that project at multiple levels can actually earn students hundreds or thousands of dollars in scholarships. With COVID came many challenges for teachers and students, but Mr. Kelly states they overcame them. Well, I mean, COVID pretty much affects everything we do in education. And so whenever you have a project that, you know, goes from September to January, uh, there's always going to be instances that pop up. You know, for example, we used two of our AMI days uh, last week, so we had to adjust our schedule. We actually moved uh, 
the science fair date from January 20th to February 10th in order to accommodate some of those AMI days. And so uh, COVID has an effect kind of on everything, whether that's you know students that are out of class for quarantine, so they don't get time in class to actually work on their project. They have to do a lot of that kind of on their own. Um, but with Google Classroom and email and, and uh, Blackboard communications, as long as everybody's communicating with, you, with each other, we can kind of keep everybody on the same page and hopefully complete the project in a timely manner so that we're able to present and everybody get uh, the credit that they need on it. We're always Mitty, I'm Joshua Wagley. Online learning is a topic that most people have to deal with since Alma has switched to a more Chromebook-based teaching method. Tegan Carlisle and Christian Carpenter asked our students which they prefer between online learning in person or learning with paper. At Alma schools, COVID is taken very seriously, not just for the students, but for the teachers too. We asked students and teachers what the difference is between remote learning and in-class learning are. I feel like it's hard, you know, for online. Doing schoolwork from home is harder because you have to email the teacher and they don't always email you back immediately. Yes, the teachers would never answer my emails. Students have a tendency to struggle with online content as opposed to in the classroom. The majority of students say it's better at school because they're not disciplined enough to do the work when they're home. Um, and I will say this, that first time that we, uh, like we got out in March and didn't come back and nobody knew we weren't going to come back, um, I did have a few students that excelled in working at home. So, but very few. The expectations of that teacher have of their students can be different and also be difficult to achieve if not in class. Well, I utilized Google Classroom. So if I would have a Google Meet so that we could talk about uh, new material, we'd just have a Google Meeting. And then I would use the stream to post notes, uh, announcements, uh, text, copies of text. And then I use the classwork section to, a post, to post their actual assignments and quizzes. And I would always attach guidelines so that the students would know what to do. I'm Tegan Carlisle with Airwaves Media. Thank you for listening. The break was a much needed refresher after the end of the last semester. However, we are now getting back into the groove of schooling and education. Ben Mitchell and Destiny Wheeler spoke to the staff to gather their opinions on the students being back. Over the winter break, students have been able to catch their breath and relax. Now that they are back, Airwaves has been thinking, how do teachers feel about the students coming back from winter break? We've interviewed a few, and, well, this is their input. Um, students who, uh, having the kids back from winter break is, is always a good thing. It's a fresh start. Um, it's a fresh start for, for them coming back and all their grades being reset. It's a, it's a fresh start for teachers uh, coming in and being able to, you know, sort of have a new beginning of the year. It's kind of like a second start. And I think what it does is it gives students a new opportunity if they uh, if they were doing well uh, last semester it gives them the opportunity to continue that if they didn't do so well last semester it gives them a fresh start and a new chance to uh, to kind of get out the gate strong and hopefully they can be more successful this semester if they did have trouble last semester I am always very excited to go on winter break and I'm also very excited to always return from winter break I enjoy my job and I really enjoy being with the students and I like to hear about what they did and what they got to experience during their time at home. Uh, it's always exciting whenever we can get back together and start uh, the next semester, whether it is we're coming back from summer break or we're coming back from winter break. To be able to, to get back, to start fresh with everybody is an exciting thing. Everybody, when they most people when they return from a break, it takes a little time to get the motor to turn over. But getting here and seeing everybody, it gets you excited about the next semester. As a freshman, it's nice to know that a lot of students are happy to be back. And although a lot still aren't, that's okay, because a lot of teachers are happy to see their students again. Um, well, students that, again, coming back, it's in the winter. Um, it, it's not like the traditional beginning of school, you know, because we've already had a semester under our belt. Um, teaching freshmen this year, uh, that first fall 
you know, in the fall, that first day of school when kids come in, you know, they're a little bit nervous because they're at a new place, so they're in a new school. Um, it, there's a lot more people on campus. And since they've gone through that for, for a full semester, now uh, that they're coming back, it's just coming back to something that they're used to. So hopefully they're more comfortable with that aspect of it. But like I said, it's all about a fresh start and a, and a new beginning for everybody involved. And hopefully uh, with, a, with a good start, uh, students and teachers and in Alma High School in general, we're all more successful moving forward. Here's Mr. Reeves sharing a bit of info on what we should keep in mind this semester. You know, the thing that students need to remember when they return from breaks, especially this second semester break, is, and I, I gave the same message to, to seniors um, in the cafeteria in the union this last week, is um, for seniors, this is your last semester here on Alma High School campus, so you need to make the most of it. You need to do the things you're supposed to do in order to get the credits you got to get. Make sure everything's in line. You are a, you are a young adult, and so you got to act like it. You got to you got to be responsible for everything that you're doing. For everybody else, you're about to be a grade older, and um, you're on a high school campus, and so we ex have certain expectations for you. Hopefully, we've got the first under, uh, semester under our belt, and everybody understands those expectations, and they come here prepared every day to learn and to succeed. What have you been excited about coming back to school for? For a few teachers, the thing that makes them happy is seeing their students again, and Airwaves is excited to see our teachers again, too. Remember, everyone, to let your teachers know that you appreciate what they do for you. This is Osiah Mitchell and Destiny Wheeler with Airwaves Media. Thank you for watching. AP, or Advanced Placement, is a kind of class that involves earning college credits hours by taking an exam at the end of the course. Ethan Moore and Dalton Davis took a look at this beneficial program. AP is what they call advanced placement. These are courses that students can take to prepare them for college. AP helps students learn the skills they need to succeed in college and careers. The teaching strategies and the expectations of the teachers in those classes are going to be similar to that of college professors. So again, it's more of a preparation experience for helping students to um, develop the skills and the knowledge and the behaviors that they're going to need to be successful college students. Well, but the AP classes, um, they tend to be a little bit more strenuous or challenging as far as the curriculum goes um, and depending on what the course is or the subject it prepares them for very specific fields um, that they'll take or look at in college and for their future careers. In AP classes you do things like reading for evidence, crafting sentences that support claims, interpreting data, and making sense of the world with quantitative information. AP teachers use a focused framework supported by gauging grade appropriate content in order to help prepare. Well, of course, it, they are college level classes, um, and if you, there are tests at the end of every AP class, so there's a test that they have to take that's a national AP test for that class. Um, and depending upon their score, they actually can get college credit for those classes. In Arkansas, if a student scores a three or better on a scale of one to five, uh, then colleges will award them college credit for that class for free. And so basically they're getting free college credit um, and are able to move faster through their degree programs in college if they are successful in the AP classes. Each student who takes AP classes, as long as they are challenging themselves, um, doing the work, thinking critically, analyzing, being active listeners, those type of skills, those are skills that they'll, res they'll need for the rest of their lives. And I think that that's what helps make them successful in AP classes. AP is an opportunity for all students. It offers grade level instructions for every student. It shows increased success with AP and gives the best in-class professional learning. AP also shows colleges and teachers looking at your records to proof of commitment. Well, it helps us in the long run for college. When we pass the test, if we pass, we'll be able to get college credit and it saves a bunch of money and is useful and gets you more on track at, during college. Well, they're college credits and if you take a certain number of them, you can get the high honors diploma, which will help you get accepted into other colleges and just more scholarships. Plus, in general, if you like learning, it's more in-depth. There's never a day where you don't have homework, but it's always beneficial. 
and normally if you try hard, then you're going to do well. AP is a special above level class to help you prepare for college and your future. This is Dawn Davis and Ethan Moore signing out. COVID has had a major impact on the world today from affecting the places we visit and even here at school. But as cases rise, how will it affect the school life today? Brianna Langston takes a look at this pressing issue. In Alma High School, we had about 20% student absences and 15% staff absences. But it, it was not all COVID related. We don't necessarily know for sure why somebody's absent. We do, we do somewhat, but not completely. But that's way, way higher than our normal absentees would be. There are possibilities of going virtual again, but the chances of it happening are slim. Uh, I'm hopeful uh, that uh, we're going the other direction right now, that our absentees are dropping, and they do seem to be dropping right now. I'm hopeful that we've, we've hit our peak and are headed back down. So if that's the case, then, then I would not see us going virtual again. The steps of knowing if you are positive for COVID is if you feel sick, just stay home. We now have tests available at school at no cost to anybody. All you got to do is go by the nurse's office or the office and ask, ask for it. You can test it right there or you can take it home and use it. Uh, but you have the opportunity to know for sure whether or not it's COVID uh, very easily. If it is COVID, you may, need, need, may want to go see your doctor to see if he has any uh, suggestions for anything in particular you need to do to be sure that you uh, stay healthy and, and get to feeling better as soon as possible. This is Brianna Langston with Airways Media. SGC stands for Student Detention Center. It is essentially our school's version of in-school suspension. Many students have been sent to SEC lately. Jace Brantley and Stetson Goodson took a deeper look into this issue. Alma High School's SDC is a punishment where students not, do not talk, have to work, and no phones. Here's the average reason kids get sent to SDC. The main reason, I think, is disruption of class, either in class or sometimes disruption in the union. Skipping, because uh, they get caught skipping always. And um, and then the other biggest issue is vaping and getting caught doing that somewhere on campus. Kids can spend a long time in SEC, but here's the average time. About the average is three days. It can be anywhere from half a day up to two weeks. This is Jace Bradley and Stetson Goodson from Airwaves Media. The Airedale Theater puts on a one-act play this year called The Messenger. Lewis Alexander and Christian Sullivan talk to the theater department to get their thoughts on the show. Thursday 27th at 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. there will be a performance at the Performing Arts Center. We talked to Danny Hobson to see what he thinks about the performance. Um, this, this play is a success for the students who have been involved with it. Uh, this is a historical play uh, based upon real events and so I think that they have grown a lot from this play and they've learned a lot. Uh, I think it's a wonderful story to share with uh, the student body. Um, this group of students have come along and have worked really hard to take a story that is not from American history and they've made it their own. Uh, and so I think it's, I think it's um, an important part of uh, history that we're probably not that familiar with that I think the audience is going to enjoy. So yes, I think it will be successful. We talked to a few of the actors, Mick Clausen and Gentry Sneed, to see Foster how they feel about no. the performance. My parts are Donald Brady and an officer. What is your favorite part? My favorite part is Donald Brady. Do you, do you like being an actor? I do. Is it fun? It is very fun. How many, how many times have you had that? Um, in production wise, probably 10 or 12 times. Do you think this play will be a success? Um, well, you'd have to define success, and I would say for this play to be successful, we're competing in a thing called Thespian Festival. So, as long as we uh, achieve a superior rating, then um, yes, I think it, it potentially could be successful. Hi, I'm Gentry Sneed. I oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Gentry Sneed. I play Molly in The Messenger, 
and I have absolutely loved doing this play because it was made for children and so that makes the acting in it really fun. Um, I think this play will be a success because I know we have all worked very hard on it and I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. This is Lewis Alexander and Chris Sullivan with Airwaves Media. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow all our social media at Airwaves Media. And as always, by the wise words of T-Mac, Go, Go Airdales! Airdales.